Okay, let's do this. Thank you so much, Ellen, Sasha, Mike, Barbara, Kara, and all the organizers, staff, and also the other speakers at Typographics. This is my favorite conference. Uh, thank you for everyone at Cooper Union and Type at Cooper. I've actually taken some type design classes there. They're really amazing. And most of all, thank you to everyone watching right now. I'm gonna be talking about resistance made visible, Black Lives Matter protest signs, murals, and to face Confederate monuments. When I think of the work I'm going to show you, I feel the weight and the heaviness of what this typography is responding to. Uprising, centuries of oppression, black bodies brutally murdered in cold blood for all to witness. By those who are supposed to protect us, bodies like mine, faces like mine. I need a greater force to help. For me, that greater force is the spirit and the words of James Baldwin. I will invoke them now. James Baldwin has written and said so much, but I'm particularly needing where he talks about the artist's or designer's responsibility for integrity and bearing witness to the world. In the fall of 1962, James Baldwin gave a lecture at Community Church in New York City entitled, The Artist's Struggle for Integrity. The speech was later broadcast via radio on WBAI. In the talk, Baldwin grapples with defining terms like artist or integrity. He concludes that an artist or designer must confront the dilemma that comes with the bearing witness that we often face. And I quote, the crime of which you discover slowly, you're guilty in not so much that you are aware, which is bad enough, but that other people see that you are and cannot bear to watch it because it testifies to the fact that they are not. You, you're bearing witness helplessly to something which everybody knows and nobody wants to face. And so as I present this work, I feel like I get to offer my own bearing of witness to the gaps and the pain in my own lived experience of a queer man of color who comes from a biracial background. And so this work is part of a rich tradition of graphics, signs, banners, images, and happenings. And so these murals that were sparked by the death of George Floyd have shown up in this explosive variety of visual language, mediums, scales, and formats. A significant aspect of this particular movement's tipping point and its diversity has to do with the wide ranging socioeconomic, racial, and class hierarchy origins for these forms and messages. So this was catalyzed by grassroots black led organizers, but we've seen interventions from independent artists, hordes of global protesters, city departments, mass and social media, and even corporate marketing departments of the world's largest corporations. I'm really interested in the variety of meeting formats and levels of finish and how they range wildly. Of particular interest to me, is this juxtaposition between street murals and the defaced Confederate monuments, primarily across the Southern United States. And as a case study, I'm gonna start with this yellow street painted Black Lives mural that was commissioned by Washington DC Mayor Muriel Bowser, and it was actually executed by city workers. And then I'm gonna compare that to a set of images of activists defaced monuments um, to Robert E. Lee in Richmond and many other Confederate figures. And a lot of those involve this ad hoc combination of spray paint and light projection. So as you look at the images and videos that I show you, there's a couple of dichotomies and things I want you to be thinking about, as I've been thinking about. This idea of 2D, 3D, or 4D space. I hope you think about the different levels of economic means and the materiality, for example, the cost of paint or paper versus the cast of or the cost of casting bronze or marble this idea of text and figuration, uh, memorial and monument, horizontality and verticality, the idea of who the maker is, is it citizen made, is it min municipally sanctioned or statecraft issue, this idea of public space or in a projected object, this idea of statuary effigy, and this idea of charge form and cast material. 
So this is probably one of the most seen murals or pieces of graphic design around the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it was painted um, in Washington, D.C. Here's a, a overall um, map where you can actually see now that there's been this like proliferation of a bunch of other murals that have been inspired by this one mural and they've spread all over the country um, and potentially all over the world. I think what's interesting about this particular mural is uh, the graphic design professions and communities response to it, in addition to other people's response to it, and a bit of a disconnect with this municipal um, city led message saying Black Lives Matter when Muriel Bowser, the mayor of DC, paradoxically had already planned to renew and increase her police budget. So there was already a counter intervention by more grassroots activists asking to defund the police and, and marking up and annotating on top of the mural. And it was interesting to sort of see the timeline of like people like Michael Beirut or Natasha Jen or like other figures kind of like calling up, this is amazing. And, you know, I myself was sort of guilty of, of that too, kind of um, entranced by the typographic exuberance of it, the scale of it, the fact that it's like the whole block, the fact that it faces the White House as a kind of F you to Trump. And then kind of thinking longer, I, would, I also saw like tweets by Eric Carter and uh, others who were sort of like questioning, saying don't fall for typography and seeing the markups of, of, of activists kind of like reinscribing typography on top of the mural and sort of this shift, you know, you see a later tweet from Michael on the left corner where it's sort of, he's now focusing on also this sort of like grassroots making that's happening rather than this sort of more like municipally organized type. And that makes me think of um, Ramon Tejada, a friend of mine and colleague has lately been talking about the difference between capital D design and lowercase D design and seeing this more collective action is sort of more lowercase d design. And there's been a ton of press about this mural. Um, I highly recommend this article if you want to kind of know more about the process of um, making the mural, because um, the team that put it together was actually not really prepared. They started painting at 3.30 in the morning um, and took them several hours just to do the B. Um, they ran out of paint halfway into the L. <laughs> And so they had to wait until 7 a.m. for hardware stores to open to get more paint. So there was this kind of franticness happening. And then there were people kind of going to work and watching what was happening and all a bunch of people just started pitching in to help. So I think that's kind of interesting that there is this sort of more complex potential reading of this piece of typography. And I think what I'm sort of asking for is like a more nuanced read. We have a tendency to really kind of like have this like polarization and bubble. And I think that can happen even in our response to visual matter, um, not just into political action, but you can see that other cities were so inspired by this symbolism that you have murals showing up in Sacramento, in Oakland. I think particularly what's interesting about the murals is you tend to see mostly them through aerial satellite photography. And so that um, sort of rendering or viewpoint um, and here in LA where I live, um, there was a huge like rainbow version of it. Um, it there's this sort of sense that there's sort of two viewers or two viewpoints, both those who are protesting and participating on the ground as I've experienced, but also this idea of like the surveillance of this protest from above, from a drone level, right? Or a satellite level. And so I think that also speaks to the global um, digital social documented reality that typography now lives in. We're not really thinking about the scale of the screen or the scale of the page or even a billboard as we would normally think, but it's actually, you know, larger than life size. And I think that really speaks to the, the just like fatigue 
so many of us are having with watching our brothers and sisters die. I love also the variations and the sort of interpolations by various localities where they're adding their own imagery and their own text. So there's this kind of like grassroots or bottom up inscription within the letter forms. And then all sorts of like iterations and alterations. Even at a school. And having the, the typography flex to the space that it's in. And so um, to transition between the murals and the monuments, I'm gonna show a couple of videos. The first one's a bit challenging. So I put the second video in as a counterpoint. We're sick of this narrative, that's what's wrong. The narrative of racism, it's a lie. Leftist lie. It's a lie from the media, the liberal left. I said no one wants Black Lives Matter here. That's what I said. Oh, really? All lives matter. Huh? Now you want to take my face? Here. Keep America's great again. That's right. Why don't you guys learn about history? The Emancipation Proclamation Act. History? You're not even. Yeah. Take a breath for a second. That's intense. Um, so, I think that video really shows you the power of typography. That through a combination of language, form, materiality, intention, context, you can create such a strong reaction that people are yelling at each other, cursing in each other's face. And so I feel like <laughs> as someone who is really upset by that other video, I just need to play this other video that to me represents the hope and the sort of like pushing back against constrictions of surveillance, of policing, of violence, um, where this woman who's identified by her Instagram handle, get this dance, um, was being detained by a police officer, uh, ends up telling him you're about to lose your job, which then gets turned into like this remix, um, which we've been having kind of a series of like, you know, remixing sounds of sort of our moment. I'm thinking of Cardi B's coronavirus song. Um, but this is a, a, a remix between DJ I Mark Please and DJ Suede. You are about to lose your job. You are about to lose your job. Get this dance. You are about to lose your job because you are detaining me for nothing. You are about to lose your job. You are about to lose your job. Get this dance. You are about to lose your job. Hey! 
And so I feel like this video and this sort of uh, viral remix aspect of it is a huge part of the context of how the images I'm showing are being perceived, read, reread, rewritten, shared, reposted. And so I transition now to Richmond, Virginia. I'm actually from Virginia. And last year I spent um, over a year working on a project at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Richmond at VCU. Um, called Great Force, which I'll talk a lot I'll talk about a little bit at the very end of this because it connects to Confederate monuments. Um, you see, rather than um, sort of paint on a horizontal surface that can be seen from above, you see inscription on these vertical surfaces. And so there's a combination of spray paint. We see signs. We see hand lettering. Well, lettering. Um, and it's, it's interesting because like when I was preparing for this talk, someone was like, wait, but like, you know, like typography and lettering are like not the same thing. And you can't say hand done typography because that's like a double or hand done lettering because it's a like uh, repetition of terms. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I study type design. But like, I think the things that we need to be focused on right now are a little bit bigger than like whether we want to call it typography or lettering. And um, just the, the power of projection, there were a series of um, rotating projectionists that over the course of the protests in Richmond um, started projecting different images onto the face of the Robert E. Lee monument, which uh, started with George Floyd, but included images of Harriet Tubman and um, MLK and, and other victims of police brutality. The site became a space for performance and dance as a form of resistance. It became a backdrop for ceremony and ritual and communion. And some of these images almost look like contemporary art to me. <laughs> um, and also the scene from like a post-apocalyptic film. And I think just the power of overwriting, rewriting at times, as we've seen in many places, the removal of these symbols of discrimination, of racism, of white supremacy, to me um, is very like striking and shocking, but also very liberating and um, uh, transformative. I think the translation of rage and transformation on to these spaces um, is this evidence of a radical shift in the visual symbols of our world of how typography and visual communication play a role in a way for collective action and collective voice. And I think because there's so much documentation of these actions, that's part of the movement and these movements being, or being able to organize digitally uh, dispersed and in rapid fashion, give me a lot of hope and also a lot of my own fire and passion. And, you know, even though a lot of these monuments have been toppled, we still have, uh, you can see this map tracker of existing remaining. This number might be a little bit different since the last couple of weeks, but um, still have 1,712 Confederate monuments um, across and standing in the United States. And so that brings me uh, to a close to just talk about a project that I worked on um, in Virginia. And I'm only going to show a couple of uh, pieces about it. But I think because I started with James Baldwin, I'm going to 
end with James Baldwin, who was um, the inspiration for this exhibition called Great Force, which is curated by Amber Sevia, where she asked contemporary artists to question and interrogate notions of race. And one of the things we were asked to do in addition to designing the book and um, exhibition was to support the research of a few artists. And there was one artist, um, Tamashi Jackson, who was looking at Confederate monuments. And so we were asked to um, create visual diagrams to kind of respond to the research. And one of the things at the time was just the like, you know, I grew up in Virginia and lived there for a long time time and you know did civics and history there and I remember going to like civil war reenactments and you know Gettysburg and all these places that had this sort of memory but I didn't really realize until working on this project the extensiveness of the number of monuments in my home state and the percentage uh, of monuments you know that are confederate versus non-confederate and so I'm just really grateful and honored to see some change starting to happen. For those of you who want to um, do further reading, reading, um, I'm happy to share this deck with you, but there's a lot of resources sort of talking about the, the impact and the sort of significance of this. And I, I look forward to any questions you all have for me. Thank you so much.